Welcome to ODI Bytes, a series of events that will address critical global challenges with key experts. In this episode, we explore the significance of the first Financing Commons Summit and how public development banks can collaborate to create sustainable growth. We hear perspectives from Remy Roux, Chief Executive of the Auchan's Francais de Développement, and Rathin Roy, Managing Director of Research and Policy at ODI. Good morning, Remy. Thank you for doing this with us. Looking forward to the summit. But I'm sure our listeners would like to know from you, what is the driving force behind Finance and Commons? And what's different about it? Why is this not just another finance summit? Hello, Ratin. Thanks to ODI for the invitation. Um, well, we're talking about 2015, uh, this message that was so strongly sent at uh, Addis, then New York, then, then Paris. And the good news is that it has arrived uh, in our constituencies. And what the Finance <laughs> Commons Summit means is this very deep consensus uh, we have reached all together on climate uh, and uh, development. It's not the case for trade, it's not the case for digital, but on these issues, sustainable development goals, I would say, uh, we have a consensus. And now the question is uh, action. The question is action at scale, at grassroots level, deep uh, into uh, our constituency. And so gathering for the first time all public development banks, multilateral, international, regional, national, sub-national, the 450 of us, will is making a, a, a difference. That's the first time ever. Um, and if we properly identify, name public development banks, this uh, very special community, uh, I think we will be consistent with the ambition of the multilateral ambition of uh, of 20, 2015. So, the, so that's the driver. That's the momentum. It took five years to arrive, but we're there yet. Well, that's interesting because uh, normally one sees these summits as being gatherings of private sector people and maybe the multilateral banks, but you are emphasizing public development banks, and that's something that I think we need to define. So really, what are public development banks and why are you saying their role is so vital? So three, three elements to define them. They are public institutions, so owned by public authorities, uh, their governments. Uh, they are financial institutions, meaning uh, uh, they have their own balance sheet and capacity to mobilize uh, the market uh, while uh, also mobilizing public resources, fiscal resources. And they are development uh, public banks, meaning they have a special uh, mandate which is distinct from uh, commercial banks following uh, public guidance, uh, meaning, uh, meaning uh, SDGs. And if we define the group like that, uh, of course, it's a very vast uh, group and you have generalist uh, institutions uh, like AFD, like Caisse des Depots in France, uh, like KFW in Germany, uh, or you, are more, you have more specialized entities in uh, financing SMEs, uh, local authorities, uh, trade, uh, but all of them, uh, they have this... Uh, this very unique capacity, I would say bridging, bridging capacity, enabling capacity. They are between uh, short term, the answer to COVID-19, expanding drastically their balance sheet right now, and long term, build back better. They are between uh, public and private, um, re receiving resources from the government and issuing uh, social uh, climate uh, sustainable bonds. They are between environmental and social. They are very interesting sensors of the reconciliations uh, we have to invent uh, to, uh, well, to for a fair, a fair and just uh, transition. They are between macro and micro. When you add the financial capacity of all these institutions, it amounts to $2.3 trillion each year. So it's a macro issue. And they are able to channel the liquidities that are now pumped into the system by the central banks 
to go at uh, the project uh, level, at the micro level. And this is a capacity that you need uh, absolutely in a financial system. And they are also at the nexus between project, concrete, and policies. If we can draw lessons from the project uh, we are financing. And last but not least, and this is what the Financing Commons Summit is about, we are now between uh, global and local. And if um, coordinated, uh, structured as a system uh, like uh, never uh, before, uh, we can connect uh, the international priority, carbon neutrality by 2050, Agenda 2030, and uh, uh, grassroots, uh, local, uh, the, project, uh, the project level. So too, too useful to fail, huh, really. <laughs> and we have to... Take, pay attention to the, the whole community and what it could provide uh, for good. Too useful to fail, $2.3 trillion and bridging the gap between the macro and the micro. These certainly sound like very important institutions. And in fact, you know, ODI just did a study. Uh, we have just about completed it on performance and governance of African public development banks. And contrary to what listeners might think, Two-thirds of African public development banks are profitable and have sound balance sheets. A third are not, but two-thirds very good. If you look at, uh, you know, for example, India's banking sector, you'd be lucky to have two-thirds without stress balance sheets. So that's not unhealthy at all. The trouble, of course, is that uh, they tend to be under-leveraged. Their gearing ratios are low, we found. And uh, therefore, their ability to deliver long-term finance is limited. So if the summit could actually help uh, draw awareness to these well-functioning banks and increase uh, the appetite for leveraging them or backstopping them, then I see a very important relationship potentially between the multilaterals and the national development banks and also the various funds that are being set up and the thorny question of how to channel them so that they hit the grassroots. So that's, that's terrific news. Uh, and our report, in a sense, reinforces the business case in Africa, and I'm sure in other places, for these development banks to begin to be looked at as a spearhead of uh, sustainable development finance. So that is true. Then the next question comes that finance is essentially private sector led, whereas development banks tend to be public sector institutions. So, Eddie, how can these public development banks work together with the private sector to deliver what they are, as you said, too useful to fail because they can deliver things others can't. But how do they get the private sector to that game? How do they work with them? No, true, Ratin. Um, $2.3 trillion is a very large uh, uh, sum, but it's, it's only 10% of global investments each year. So meaning there are 90% uh, there that has to be uh, mobilized, uh, reoriented uh, as well in the direction of, uh, of, uh, of SDGs. So the question is, um, yes, if we succeed uh, by the 12th of November to correct uh, uh, the bias uh, removes somehow the stigma that, that is attached uh, to public development banks and, and the ODI study, uh, fascinating, uh, will help uh, a lot on, on this as well as uh, the 15 uh, research papers that will be published uh, at that time. There's a research conference 9th and 10th of November. If we succeed, it's not, of course, to have a pro-domo manifestation uh, uh, about public development banks is to clear, clearly identify what is their role in the financial system, uh, more broadly speaking, and engage a, a structured and in-depth dialogue with the other stakeholders, meaning uh, local authorities, uh, meaning uh, civil society, uh, meaning central banks, uh, of course, talking about liquidity, and uh, meaning uh, uh, the private sector. And we are at a very uh, interesting um, moment when uh, we are rediscovering our full potential to enable uh, and mobilize 
the private sector and at the same time uh, the private sector because the crisis is so deep and, and because private actors they are now aware of uh, the transformation the transition uh, that they have to uh, accomplish uh, as well we we are getting way, way closer and we are by hundreds thousands of uh, examples inventing uh, new ways uh, to invest together to cooperate we're not there yet uh, and this dialogue is much uh, uh, needed uh, in order to uh, well from billions to trillions in order to uh, uh, to replicate to uh, industrialize uh, uh, these types of um, connections and, and and action and and of course uh, help uh, the business, the public development banks uh, reinvent their own balance sheets because at the time we also need to pay our, our salaries and, and to be a robust and solid uh, uh, institutions uh, with the financial autonomy uh, to play our part on behalf of, of the government. So the, so the summit uh, will only be a start. Uh, but there will be a lot of colleagues from the private sector um, and we will structure this discussion um, uh, by the Financing Commons Summit uh, uh, for the second edition. Oh, the second edition, excellent, because that would really be where I think we we'll start looking at those billions becoming trillions. Uh, in preparation for the second edition, may I just add that as a macroeconomist, that there are huge advantages to development to, to these public development banks being part of the financing game, especially in low income and lower middle income countries. And that is because to the extent that finance is, you know, comes in from abroad, uh, if you bring in a billion dollars into a country with, let's say, you know, uh, 10 billion dollars of domestic finance, then that impacts domestic interest rates that also impacts the current account because dollars coming in or euros coming in can raise the price of the domestic currency. And therefore, the central bank might say, hmm, I'm not going to spend these dollars. I'm just going to buy them and not issue local currency uh, in tandem. And then it doesn't get spent. Now, with development banks, because they are nationally owned, you can actually calibrate financial flows to them and in a sense replicate what emerging economies like India and Brazil and Indonesia are you know, very successfully able to do with FDI and FII consistent with good macroeconomic management. So I'd say that the development banks actually have a macroeconomic role as well. They can smooth out exchange rate fluctuations, they can help with current account management and they can provide uh, long-term investors like pension funds and others with the confidence that their activities will be monitored by the government and the government can act as a buffer to any kind of you know potential fears of loss due to regulatory and institutional risk. So in that sense it's also an important institutional reform which will bolster the macroeconomics of many developing countries by making sure that finance is not bottlenecked by the fear of regulatory and institutional risk. Because now you have a buffer between the direct investor and the uh, foreign investor. Whereas in the past, without that buffer, there was no aggregation. So I, I think that there's a lot of scope here for us to uh, uh, see these actors emerging as much, much larger actors. They already are in many emerging economies, but in a much wider set of countries. So that's great news. Remy, any closing statements, any takeaways you want for the people who are going to be watching what happens at the summit? The key role of multilateral development banks, they, they're part of the architecture and they, they are, they've been, they will be more and more uh, the platform of all public development banks, re reinforcing capacities, uh, providing concessional resources and leveraging uh, the, the combined balance sheet of all these institutions. And there's nowhere where it's more important than in Africa. Uh, you stressed it, uh, Ratin, 95 uh, public development banks in Africa, um, they should be uh, strongly strengthened in order to play their, their, their full uh, role, uh, especially when we will uh, recover from this crisis. So thanks a lot to you all. Thank you, Remy. So just to close, uh, you know, we finance guys, we always say that when you ask, can we afford something or where did we get the money? The money is always available. 
if you are able to convince people that there is a way to spend it well. And I think that there was a missing part of that dialogue in that conversation in many developing countries. The metrics the private sector applied to decide whether money is being well spent, the information they had was not available. I think what we are hearing from Remy is that these development banks present a powerful new uh, change in the institutional architecture where multilateral finance, bilateral finance, and commercial finance can be, channel can be channeled effectively to demonstrate the viable projects, thereby furthering the cause of both economic and inclusive growth and, of course, sustainable development. Thank you for tuning into ODI Bytes. Find out more on odi.org forward slash events.